retrospect now, are you aware of the influence you've had on the music of the musician? I can't say specifically, no, but I think I think collectively we, we have, you know. I, I, I think anybody who's still playing is just glad to be playing. Anybody who's still making a living is glad to make a living. So, yeah, there, there's way more gratitude now than there was 15 or 20 years ago. And, and like Tom or, or Alan was saying, you know, now that Rolling Stone has said, oh, you guys are okay. I mean, you don't want to, you, you don't want to, you know, kind of piss on the person who's giving you a compliment, but at the same time, it's like, what took you so long? And, and you know, the, the whole revisionist history, of like, oh, Rolling Stone always supported the Rolling Stone, uh, the Ramones, it's a bunch of fucking bullshit. They said their records stunk and there were no leads and they were too short and the lyrics were dumb and all. And then we read that and thought, hmm, sounds good to me. <laughs> Let's go get that record. You know, so. All right, so I'll read a little something and then, uh, and then we'll sign. Do we know where the signing thing is going to happen? Uh, Alex said they're going to bring a table out uh, here and we'll get out here. All right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, Maxine's uh, chapter was about the um, about the cultural revolution that we, were, we thought we were part of. Yeah, and uh, and and this follows her chapter um, because we lived together over on uh, Genesee. North Genesee Bullet, uh, Avenue, and uh, our our names are car I, I carved our names into the, into the uh, curb, uh, and it's still there, which is kind of nice. <laughs> Chapter three. Chapter three. A hundred lives are shoved inside. When Exine and I lived in West Hollywood from 1979 to 1982, there wasn't a there wasn't a moment's rest. It seemed every day and every night someone was knocking on, our, on the door of our tiny duplex with a couple quarts of East Side of Bukowski endorsed local brew. There were only four rooms, including the bathroom, which had aluminum foil for wallpaper. 1118 North Genesee was half a block north of Santa Monica Boulevard, the Spike, a popular leather bar, and the strip where most of the gay hustlers worked. Even one of our friends who went by the name Tony the Hustler wait for the pool and for them to finish their rounds. Also known as uh, Tony the Tiger, was, uh, was, uh, would tell us stories about going to see Paul Lamb, that was exciting. Uh, I believe the rent was $250 and the place was just south of the Heart of the Beast. Exine had an eye for decoration, loved anything, especially bark cloth, from the 1930s and 40s. Our place had, uh, had as many pieces as she could bring from Florida and what we found at junk stores. We loaded our mantelpiece with as much scary voodoo type stuff we could find, hoping it would discourage people from breaking in. Of course, there was nothing to steal, except maybe a couple of guitars, a rhinestone tiara, or some engineer boots. Billy Zoom slept on the couch for three months or more, our biker roadie, Chuck, fell asleep smoking in a chair, set fire to it, and his prized leather jacket, and the prized leather jacket he was wearing. I remember waking up to three, at 3 a.m. to smoke, Chuck and Billy yelling, and someone, maybe me, hoisting the smoldering chair out of the door, over the wall of the four-step tiny balcony landing that led to our front door and onto the curb. We drenched it with a garden hose and crawled back to bed. <laughs> We were roused again an hour later by a fire truck clanging up to our duplex, hosing down that beautiful, tenacious, and now sad 1940s chair. After playing two shows at the Whiskey A Go Go, we, lived, we filmed in that living room, high on speed, drinking, tattooing each other for the decline of Western civilization. I believe we had an impromptu wake there for Exine's sister Muriel. In the middle of the night, I gave teenage runaway Gary Ryan a black eye for screaming that I had slept with his wannabe girlfriend, Lorna Doom of the Germs. Only now can I admit that I had. <laughs> and in that Hollywood duplex, we wrote and lived out all the songs for Wild Gift and Under the Big Black Sun. There's one chapter. See, I wrote a bunch of in-between stuff. Not full. I wrote some full chapters, and then 
kind of kind of tied it together with um, these little interstitial pieces. Uh, where's the other one? Chapter 20, Sunglasses and Cool Cars. Cars, rock and roll, and sunglasses are in some. This is where Los Angeles tapped into something darker and more dangerous than New York or London's punk rock. Young Hollywood movie stars' lives were cut short in car crashes. People got laid in back seats. You could escape to the desert or drive up the coast with the windows rolled down and blow out all those dark, sad thoughts that are questions you in the city. In 1977 in Los Angeles, you could drive without constant gridlock, park pretty much anywhere. Because it was California, there was no rust to speak of. You could buy a drivable 1950s or 60s car for $500. Take it to East LA or Echo Park and get the seats completely redone for 200 bucks. And Billy Zoom might teach you how to fix them without making you feel like too much of a dummy. <laughs> we would change the oil, points and plugs, adjust the timing, replace brakes or transmissions, and even convert a, a step van bread truck into a tour bus on the curb outside 1118 North Genesee. By the way, this still continues because there's a dude out here working on a mid-90s Dodge van, uh, like fixing the differential, which is like a pretty heavy duty in the fucking parking lot. <laughs> and it made my, it warmed my, my heart to see that that tradition is still working, still uh, humble. Okay. This was all part of the DIY movement. And also, it was also cheaper. It seemed like Falcons, both Chris D and Alice Bang, Delta 88s, Nikki B, Sport Furies, Gil T, Coop DeVille's, Bill Bateman, or even the humble Dodge Darts were so available that anyone could, who didn't live at the Canterbury, walking distance from the mask on Hollywood Boulevard, could make them into their own punk rock carpet. Uh, magic punk rock carpet. Uh, these rides and the punishing sunlight also provided everyone plenty of opportunity for wearing 50s and 60s sunglasses, so plentiful at many thrift stores that weren't yet curated or picked over. Other sunglasses, other sunglass wearers, even the silly new wave ones, were those who took the most unreliable mass transit in any metropolitan center, the LA bus system. <laughs> Their reward for this sacrifice was encountering the craziest of crazies in all <laughs> metro LA. Great material for stories or songs at parties. All of this distance and freedom gave Los Angeles punk rock more gasoline leaded exhaust fumes, rumble, muscle, and smoking tires than the punk rock that came before. New York bands, as influential as they were on LA, had art galleries, and London, who spun our heads and inspired, had the doll. But LA freeways, California auto culture, and that freedom, that speed, the horizon with the windows rolled down on warm nights, connected us to Chuck Berry, The Doors, Sun Records, and Eddie Cochran. So, I want to thank the uh, the people of Stories here, and Liz and, and Alex and everybody who put this together, uh, Tom and Chris and, and Chris, and we'll be signing some stuff. And uh, and there's all kinds of other people like uh, Exine and Pleasant Game and Henry Rollins and Mike Watt and uh, Jack Grisham and, and Christine McKenna, all and, and many many photographs, pictures which everybody likes pictures and, and uh, yeah, we'll be signing some books. Okay, thanks.